my name is Lindsay. I teach ACT2 chemistry at Stevens Academy. For SAT2 chemistry, you have 85 questions to solve in one hour. Um, if you are wondering about the question types in the SAT2 chemistry, you might want to find the diagnostic te test in this book. The Barron's book actually covers all the topics in general chemistry very thoroughly, so I chose this book. The explanations and the practice problems are very similar to the real SAT test. Okay, so um, if you are wondering about the question solving, actually you might want to go to the diagnostic test on page 7 in this book. Okay, so as you can see, um, in the SAT2 chemistry, you find three different types of questions. The first part, part A, is the simple answer questions. Okay, so you just simply answer um, the questions with the multiple choice like this. Okay, um, and the part B actually has true or false questions like this, okay? So you find each statement and decide whether or not it's true or false, okay? And if there's any correlation between two statements. Part C is like a general multiple choice questions, okay? So including all of these part, um, three parts, actually the entire questions are 85 questions. This parents book, you can find it online like on amazon.com or the bookstore. For SAT2 chemistry, there are two lectures for me. The first one is the concepts lecture, and the second one is the problem solving. This Barron's book actually contains all the concepts that you should know for uh, the SAT2 chemistry. So um, I'm just going to go over thoroughly about the topics that's covered in this book. Also, um, for the calculations problem like stoichiometry or gas questions or equilibrium, uh, you might want to solve like extra questions to practice more. Then I added some extra questions from um, other resources. So my concepts lecture covers uh, enough of the practice um, that you need for the SAT2 chemistry. The problem solving lecture covers the practice test and diagnostic test that is in this book. In this book there are three practice tests and one diagnostic test. Okay? All of them is 85 questions so um, all those four tests um, are covered in the pro problem solving lecture. Okay? For problem solving, I reviewed briefly about the topics uh, that appears on each question, but it's only a brief explanation. So if you can't really recall the concepts generally, then you might want to go back to the chapter and review it thoroughly again. So always remember, after each lecture that I give, you should go back to the topic and review that topic very thoroughly and practice enough with the chapter questions. Okay, so as long as you um, make, uh, make an enough effort, then you should be able to score good enough on the SAT2 Biology and Chemistry. Thank you. Good luck. Hi. Um, so last class, um, we talked about the atomic structure, right, the particles in the atoms, and also a few scientists um, who led to the discovery of the particles and the atomic structure, right? So we were up to number four. Um, so to briefly review, there were J.J. Thompson, cathode ray experiment, okay? He found out the charge per mass of electron. Number two was Robert Millikan, Okay, and he found out the charge of one electron, of one electron, okay? Number three was um, Rutherford, okay? And he found out there's a nucleus at the center of an atom, and also it is very dense and small volume, okay? And also the empty space. So atom is mainly empty space, right? Okay, so he found out the uh, brief atomic structure, okay? Number four was Bohr, okay? So he went more specific about the atomic structure and the energy level of the electrons, right? So he did the quantized electrons, right? So he said that there are different energy levels okay, inside the, inside the atom, okay, so 
it is 2n squared, meaning each energy level could have different number of electrons, right? So for example, n is equal to 1, so the first energy level could have 2 electrons, right? n is equal to 2 could have 8 electrons, n is equal to 3 could have 18 electrons, and so on. Okay, and as you go up the energy level, as you go farther away from the nucleus, okay, energy could get higher, right? So, and then we talked about the emission spectrum. Emission spectrum, right? So, when the electron go down the energy level, there is extra energy, right? So that extra energy actually gets emitted as light. Okay, and that's called photons, right? So different jumps, let's say three to one, okay, or two to one, so different jumps can have different wavelength, different energy, right? So those kind of jumps could actually be classified to three, right? Lyman series, Balmer series, and Passion series, okay? We talked about that last time, okay? So today we're going to talk about Planck, De Broglie, and Heisenberg. Okay, so up to here, right, scientists believe that electrons are just particles, right, particles that we could see. But these three scientists actually were kind of confused because there were dual properties when it comes to electrons okay, and light, photons. So Planck said light has dual properties, dual properties, okay. What it means is that light could also be particles, but also wave. So particle, but also wave. Okay, it's completely different concept, okay? Particle is actually like what we could see. But wave is like, we can't really see it, but we can visualize it as something like this, right? So we could graph it like this, but we can't really see each particle, okay? So these two are completely different properties. And he said that light photons could have dual properties, right? So De Broglie and Heisenberg actually admitted Right? They accepted this idea, and De Broglie said electrons also have dual properties. Dual properties. Okay? So De Broglie uh, was about the electrons, and Planck was about the light photons, right? Okay? So that led to the number seven, Heisenberg. Okay? So Heisenberg came up with uncertainty principle. Okay, so this is the major principle that we talk about when it comes to electrons now, okay? So this is more mo modern, okay, compared to Bohr theory uh, in terms of the atom, right? Okay, so Heisenberg said, Heisenberg said, so Heisenberg actually um, believed in the wave properties of the electron, okay? So he said, Position and momentum of electrons cannot be found simultaneously. Simultaneously. Okay, so it means that uh, position and momentum, so where the electron is inside the atom and how it's moving inside the atom cannot be figured out, okay? But Heisenberg actually said, so it's uncertain, right? We don't know, but we just came up with a probability. So we came up with a region where electrons can be found, right? So this is very different from this, because Bohr actually came up with these certain energy levels, right? And it's also called orbit. So this is Bohr theory, right? So as we drew before, when there's a nucleus, right, there's an electron circling around 
the nucleus right this, okay? So this was Bohr's theory, but this was wrong. So the modern theory of atom is that we don't, we don't draw it like this, okay? But we talk about orbitals now. Orbital, okay? So orbital is actually a different concept from this. So this is the region, region where electrons can be found, can be found. Okay, so this is very different because Heisenberg said uh, electrons are not particles, but it's more of wave, okay? So it's more of probability, okay? So this is a possible region where we can, we can, um, we can find the electrons, okay? But we don't know where, okay? So this is more like uncertain property of the electron. Okay, so, so far we talked about the seven scientists um, that talked about the atomic structure and the particles inside the atom, okay? So we're going to move to the periodic table now, okay? We're going to come back to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle and orbitals later, but before that, <clears throat> we're going to talk about a few concepts that appear on the periodic table. So when you look at the periodic table, In your book, um, when you go to page three, there's a diagnostic test, right? So two pages before that, there's a periodic table, okay? So there, when you look at carbon, carbon is six, okay? So it says like this. Okay, so what does that mean, right? So on the periodic table, each atom, so these represents atoms, okay? Each atoms have different properties. So this actually represents atomic number, okay? So what is atomic number? It is the number of protons inside the atoms, okay? So remember, inside the nucleus, there are two particles, neutron and protons, right? So the number of protons is actually a very um, specific, okay? Very like a unique characteristic of an atom, okay? So by just atomic number, we can just tell the atom. So when you talk about atomic number six, it's always carbon, okay? When you talk about atomic number seven, it's always nitrogen, okay? So it's a unique property of each atom. So number of proton is atomic number. This is average atomic weight. Okay, so why do we call this average, right? Okay, so in order to know this, we have to know another concept called isotope. Okay, so when we talk about isotope, um, we mean this, okay? So for, for example, for carbon, okay, we have three different types of carbon that can be found on Earth, okay? We have carbon-12, carbon-13, carbon-14, okay? So what this means, so these numbers are called mass number, mass number, okay? This is different from atomic mass, or atomic number, okay? So mass number is basically number of nucleons, okay? So remember the nucleons was the, the proton and neutron together, okay? So this means that inside carbon-12, there are 12 nucleons inside here, right? But you know that carbon actually has six as atomic number. Every carbon atom has six as atomic number, right? So you can tell that carbon-12 has six, six protons and six neutrons, okay? So 
it has six neutrons inside the carbon 12, okay? How about this? So this is also carbon, right? So carbon, every carbon has six protons, okay? And this has seven neutrons, right? So that's for carbon 13, okay? Carbon 14 has also six protons because it's called carbon, right? And eight neutrons. Okay, so when you look at this, right, each of this is carbon isotope, right? So carbon-12 isotope, carbon-13 isotope, carbon-14 isotope, right? So they are the same in the number of atomic number, right, in the number of protons, but they're different in the number of neutrons, okay? So that's the definition of isotope. Same number of protons, but different number of neutrons. Okay, so that is called isotope, right? So, um, when we talk about the mass, right? Mm, okay, when we talk about the mass, proton and neutron nearly has one AMU as a mass, okay? So this is not exactly 1, but it's 1.00 something AMU. AMU is a unit for the mass, okay? Mass of an atom. This is also 1.00 something AMU, right? And electron is almost 0 AMU. Okay, so these particles, these two particles, actually determine the entire mass of the atom, right? So that's why the mass number is basically about these two, okay? So when we talk about the mass of this isotope, right, then it's going to be just 12 AMU, right? Nearly 12, okay? This is going to be 13 AMU. Right? And this is going to be 14 AMU. Okay? So, these three different types can be found on Earth. Right? But why does this state that average of these three is going to be 12.011? Right? So, if you just average this out, it's going to be 13. Right? But this is not um, how they calculate it out. Okay? How they calculate it out is on page 67. Is on page 67. Okay? So calculating average atomic mass, right? So this is actually average, okay? Is basically based on abundance. Okay? It's called relative abundance. Okay? So it depends on how common the isotope is on Earth. Okay? So it means that carbon-12 is the most common one. Okay? So this is like 98%. Okay? 98% of the carbon is actually carbon-12. Okay? And the other two is very rare. Okay? So if you average out based on the percentage, based on the relative abundance, then the average weight is going to be 12.011, okay? So let's try one example um, of calculation, okay? So on page 67, um, there are two different isotopes of copper, right? So Cu63 and Cu65. So these are two different isotopes of copper, okay? And um, so each of this, so this is going to be nearly 63 AMU, okay? Specifically, it's going to be 62.919 AMU, okay? And this is nearly 65 AMU. Specifically, it's going to be... I am new.
Okay? So on the SAT questions, actually these are going to be given. Okay? So if these are given and they give you the relative abundance, so here it says this isotope is 69% okay, of the entire copper. And this is 30% of the entire copper, okay? So the, these are relative abundance, okay? Then how you're going to calculate it is just multiply this by this, okay? Plus multiply this by this, okay? So 60, 62.919 times 0. Point this, okay? Relative abundance plus this times 0. 0.3083, okay? Then this is going to give you average atomic mass, okay? So here, this is the atomic mass of this isotope, right? This is atomic mass of this isotope, okay? And this is relative abundance of this isotope, right, okay? And this is the relative abundance of this isotope, okay? So you just multiply each, and then it leads to the average atomic mass, okay? These two, these two are not shown on the periodic table, okay? Only thing that you can get from the periodic table is the atomic number and the average atomic mass, okay? And the symbol. So those three are all given on the periodic table, but the rest of it um, are not given on the periodic table. Okay, so these are the terms that you should know, um, basically, for the periodic table. Okay? Okay, so let's talk more about the Heisenberg's uncertainty principle now. Okay? So different from Bohr, which talked about the orbit, right, circling around the nucleus, right, okay, he talked about the orbitals. Okay, so what was the orbitals? There was a region where electrons can possibly be found, right? It's very uncertain. But, so for the orbitals, we talk about four different orbitals, right? So we talk about S, P, D, F, usually. Okay, and there are more orbitals, but this is irrelevant to the SAT. Okay, so for orbitals, how you can figure it out is just by looking at the periodic table. Okay, so periodic table looks like this. Okay, looks like this, and then there's a region here. Okay, so the atoms in this region, okay, is in orbital S, okay? So this is a region for S orbital. I'll, I'll explain this more, okay? This could be confusing at first, but this is very easy. So this is D region, okay? And this is P, oh, P region, okay, P. And this is F, okay? So, I'll give you one example. Um, let's say beryllium, right? So beryllium is right here. This is H. Helium, right? Okay. Then, we're going to talk about something called electron configuration now. Okay? So, electron configuration okay so electron configuration actually show you okay it shows um, which how many electrons are in which orbital okay so for beryllium for example okay you start from the top right here okay so this is one energy level one okay s one, right? So this is 1s1, okay? One electron in energy level one, okay? 
this is energy level 1, S2. Okay? So as you go to the right, okay, the, the electron um, gets greater, right? The number of electron gets greater by 1, okay? When you go to the next energy level, it's going to be n is equal to 2. Okay? So n is equal to 2. And then this is S region, S1. Like this, okay? And this is 2, S2. Okay? So when we talk about the electron configuration of beryllium, okay, we say that 1S2, 2s2, okay? 1s2, 2s2, okay? So you just start from here and then go all the way to beryllium, okay? Let's, um, I'm going to give you another example. So for the next atom, boron, right? Boron's right here, okay? So this is in P region now. So this is going to be 2p1. 2p, the first box, so 1, okay? So for a boron now, it's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. So that's going to be the electron configuration for boron, right? So overall, there are five electrons in the boron, okay? So five electrons in boron, and that actually matches the atomic number, right? So atomic number remember is what? The number of protons, right? So usually for general atoms, right? Atoms are neutral. Atoms are neutral, okay? So usually the atomic number and the number of electrons are the same for atoms because it's neutral, okay? The charge is zero. But for ions, okay, the number of protons and number of electrons could differ, right? Because it's charged, okay? Uh, we'll do another example. So the next atom is carbon, okay? So this is 2p2, okay? 2p, the second box from here, so 2, right? So carbon is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p2, like this, okay? The next atom is going to be nitrogen, so nitrogen is going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p3, right? 2p4, 2p5, 2p6. So it goes all the way to 2p6 right here. Is that okay? Okay, so next time when we come back, we'll talk more about the electron configuration and the quantum number.